The Discourses of Epictetus Translated by George Long Book 3 Chapter 8 How we must exercise ourselves against appearances, fantasias. As we exercise ourselves against sophistical questions, so we ought to exercise ourselves daily against appearances, for these appearances also propose questions to us. A certain person's son is dead. Answer, the thing is not within the power of the will, it is not an evil. A father has disinherited a certain son. What do you think of it? It is a thing beyond the power of the will, not an evil. Caesar has condemned a person. It is a thing beyond the power of the will, not an evil. The man is afflicted at this. Affliction is a thing which depends on the will, it is an evil. He has borne the condemnation bravely. That is a thing within the power of the will, it is a good. If we train ourselves in this manner, we shall make progress, for we shall never assent to anything of which there is not an appearance capable of being comprehended. Your son is dead. What has happened? Your son is dead. Nothing more? Nothing. Your ship is lost. What has happened? Your ship is lost. A man has been led to prison. What has happened? He has been led to prison. But that herein he has fared badly, every man adds from his own opinion. But Zeus, you say, does not do right in these matters. Why? Because he has made you capable of endurance? Because he has made you magnanimous? Because he has taken, from that which befalls you, the power of being evils? Because it is in your power to be happy while you are suffering what you suffer, because he has opened the door to you, when things do not please you? Man, go out and do not complain. Hear how the Romans feel towards philosophers, if you would like to know. Italicus, who was the most in repute of the philosophers, once when I was present being vexed with his own friends, and as if he was suffering something intolerable said, I cannot bear it. You are killing me, you will make me such as that man is, pointing to me. Book 3 Chapter 9 To a certain rhetorician who was going up to Rome on a suit. When a certain person came to him who was going up to Rome on account of a suit which had regard to his rank, Epictetus inquired the reason of his going to Rome, and the man then asked what he thought about the matter. Epictetus replied, If you ask me what you will do in Rome, whether you will succeed or fail, I have no rule, theorema, about this. But if you ask me how you will fare, I can tell you, if you have right opinions, dogmata, you will fare well, if they are false, you will fare ill. For to every man the cause of his acting is opinion. For what is the reason why you desired to be elected governor of the nations? Your opinion. What is the reason that you are now going up to Rome? Your opinion. And going in winter, and with danger and expense. I must go. What tells you this? Your opinion. Then, if opinions are the causes of all actions, and a man has bad opinions, such as the cause may be, such also is the effect. Have we then all sound opinions, both you and your adversary? And how do you differ? But have you sounder opinions than your adversary? Why? You think so. 
And so does he think that his opinions are better, and so do madmen. This is a bad criterion. But show to me that you have made some inquiry into your opinions and have taken some pains about them. And as now you are sailing to Rome in order to become governor of the nations, and you are not content to stay at home with the honors which you had, but you desire something greater and more conspicuous, so when did you ever make a voyage for the purpose of examining your own opinions? And casting them out, if you have any that are bad? Whom have you approached for this purpose? What time have you fixed for it? What age? Go over the times of your life by yourself, if you are ashamed of me, knowing the fact, when you were a boy, did you examine your own opinions? And did you not then, as you do all things now, do as you did do? And when you were become a youth and attended the rhetoricians, and yourself practiced rhetoric, what did you imagine that you were deficient in? And when you were a young man and engaged in public matters, and pleaded causes yourself, and were gaining reputation, who then seemed your equal? And when would you have submitted to any man examining and showing that your opinions are bad? What then do you wish me to say to you? Help me in this matter. I have no theorem, rule, for this. Nor have you, if you came to me for this purpose, come to me as a philosopher, but as to a seller of vegetables or a shoemaker. For what purpose, then, have philosophers' theorems? For this purpose, that whatever may happen, our ruling faculty may be and continue to be conformable to nature. Does this seem to you a small thing? No, but the greatest. What then? Does it need only a short time? And is it possible to seize it as you pass by? If you can, seize it. Then you will say, I met with Epictetus as I should meet with a stone or a statue for you saw me, and nothing more. But he meets with a man as a man, who learns his opinions, and in his turn shows his own. Learn my opinions, show me yours, and then say that you have visited me. Let us examine one another, if I have any bad opinion, take it away, if you have any, show it. This is the meaning of meeting with a philosopher. Not so, you say, but this is only a passing visit, and while we are hiring the vessel, we can also see Epictetus. Let us see what he says. Then you go away and say, Epictetus was nothing, he used solecisms and spoke in a barbarous way. For of what else do you come as judges? Well, but a man may say to me, if I attend to such matters, as you do, I shall have no land, as you have none, I shall have no silver cups, as you have none, nor fine beasts, as you have none. In answer to this it is perhaps sufficient to say, I have no need of such things, but if you possess many things, you have need of others, whether you choose or not, you are poorer than I am. What then have I need of? Of that which you have not, of firmness, of a mind which is conformable to nature, of being free from perturbation. Whether I have a patron or not, what is that to me? But it is something to you. I am richer than you, I am not anxious what Caesar will think of me. For this reason, I flatter no man. This is what I possess, instead of vessels of silver and gold. You have utensils of gold, but your discourse, your opinions, your assents, your movements, pursuits, your desires are of earthenware. But when I have these things conformable to nature, why should I not employ my studies also upon reason? For I have leisure, my mind is not distracted. What shall I do, since I have no distraction? What more suitable to a man have I than this? When you have nothing to do, you are disturbed, you go to the theater or you wander about without a purpose. Why should not the philosopher labor to improve his reason? You employ yourself about crystal vessels, 
I employ myself about the syllogism named the lying, you about mirroring vessels, I employ myself about the syllogism named the denying, two apophiscontos. To you everything appears small that you possess, to me all that I have appears great. Your desire is insatiable, mine is satisfied. Two children who put their hand into a narrow-necked earthen vessel and bring out figs and nuts, this happens, if they fill the hand, they cannot take it out, and then they cry. Drop a few of them, and you will draw things out. And do you part with your desires, do not desire many things, and you will have what you want. Book 3 Chapter 10 In what manner we ought to bear sickness? When the need of each opinion comes, we ought to have it in readiness, on the occasion of breakfast, such opinions as relate to breakfast, in the bath, those that concern the bath, in bed, those that concern bed. Let sleep not come upon thy languid eyes. Before each daily action thou hast scanned. What's done amiss, what done, what left undone. From first to last examine all, and then. Blame what is wrong, in what is right rejoice. And we ought to retain these verses in such way that we may use them, not that we may utter them aloud, as when we exclaimed P. and Apollo. Again in fever we should have ready such opinions as concern a fever, and we ought not, as soon as the fever begins, to lose and forget all. A man who has a fever, may say, if I philosophize any longer, may I be hanged, wherever I go, I must take care of the poor body, that a fever may not come. But what is philosophizing? Is it not a preparation against events which may happen? Do you not understand that you are saying something of this kind? If I shall still prepare myself to bear with patience what happens, may I be hanged. But this is just as if a man after receiving blows should give up the pancratium. In the pancratium it is in our power to desist and not to receive blows. But in the other matter, if we give up philosophy, what shall we gain? What then should a man say on the occasion of each painful thing? It was for this that I exercised myself, for this I disciplined myself. God says to you, Give me a proof that you have duly practiced athletics, that you have eaten what you ought, that you have been exercised, that you have obeyed the elliptes, the oiler and rubber. Then do you show yourself weak when the time for action comes? Now is the time for the fever. Let it be born well. Now is the time for thirst, bear it well. Now is the time for hunger, bear it well. Is it not in your power? Who shall hinder you? The physician will hinder you from drinking, but he cannot prevent you from bearing thirst well, and he will hinder you from eating but he cannot prevent you from bearing hunger well. But I cannot attend to my philosophical studies. And for what purpose do you follow them? Slave, is it not that you may be happy, that you may be constant, is it not that you may be in a state conformable to nature and live so? What hinders you when you have a fever from having your ruling faculty conformable to nature? Here is the proof of the thing, here is the test of the philosopher. For this also is a part of life, like walking, like sailing, like journeying by land, so also is fever. Do you read when you are walking? No. Nor do you when you have a fever. But if you walk about well, you have all that belongs to a man who walks. If you bear a fever well, you have all that belongs to a man in a fever. What is it to bear a fever well? 
not to blame God or man, not to be afflicted at that which happens, to expect death well and nobly, to do what must be done, when the physician comes in, not to be frightened at what he says, nor if he says, you are doing well, to be overjoyed. For what good has he told you? And when you were in health, what good was that to you? And even if he says, you are in a bad way, do not despond. For what is it to be ill? Is it that you are near the severance of the soul and the body? What harm is there in this? If you are not near now, will you not afterwards be near? Is the world going to be turned upside down when you are dead? Why then do you flatter the physician? Why do you say, if you please, Master, I shall be well? Why do you give him an opportunity of raising his eyebrows, being proud, or showing his importance? Do you not value a physician, as you do a shoemaker when he is measuring your foot, or a carpenter when he is building your house, and so treat the physician as to the body which is not yours, but by nature dead? He who has a fever has an opportunity of doing this, if he does these things, he is what belongs to him. For it is not the the business of a philosopher to look after these externals, neither his wine nor his oil nor his poor body, but his own ruling power. But as to externals how must he act? So far as not to be careless about them. Where then is there reason for fear? Where is there then still reason for anger, and a fear about what belongs to others, about things which are of no value? For we ought to have these two principles in readiness, that except the will nothing is good nor bad, and that we ought not to lead events, but to follow them. My brother ought not to have behaved thus to me. No, but he will see to that, and, however he may behave, I will conduct myself towards him as I ought. For this is my own business, that belongs to another, no man can prevent this, the other thing can be hindered. Book 3 Chapter 11 Certain Miscellaneous Matters There are certain penalties fixed as by law for those who disobey the divine administration. Whoever thinks any other thing to be good except those things which depend on the will, let him envy, let him desire, let him flatter, let him be perturbed. Whoever considers anything else to be evil, let him grieve, let him lament, let him weep, let him be unhappy. And yet, though so severely punished, we cannot desist. Remember what the poet says about the stranger. Stranger, I must not, e'en if a worse man come. This then may be applied even to a father, I must not, even if a worse man than you should come, treat a father unworthily, for all are from paternal Zeus. And, let the same be said, of a brother, for all are from the Zeus who presides over kindred. And so in the other relations of life, we shall find Zeus to be an inspector. Book 3 Chapter 12 About Exercise We ought not to make our exercises consist in means contrary to nature and adapted to cause admiration, for if we do so, we who call ourselves philosophers shall not differ at all from jugglers. For it is difficult even to walk on a rope, and not only difficult, but it is also dangerous. All we for this reason to practice walking on a rope, or setting up a palm tree, or embracing statues? By no means. Everything which is difficult and dangerous is not suitable for practice, 
but that is suitable which conduces to the working out of that which is proposed to us. And what is that which is proposed to us as a thing to be worked out? To live with desire and aversion, avoidance of certain things, free from restraint. And what is this? Neither to be disappointed in that which you desire, nor to fall into anything which you would avoid. Towards this object, then exercise, practice, ought to tend. For since it is not possible to have your desire, not disappointed in your aversion free from falling into that which you would avoid, without great and constant practice, you must know that if you allow your desire and aversion to turn to things which are not within the power of the will, you will neither have your desire capable of attaining your object, nor your aversion free from the power of avoiding that which you would avoid. And since strong habit leads, prevails, and we are accustomed to employ desire and aversion only to things which are not within the power of our will, we ought to oppose to this habit a contrary habit, and where there is great slipperiness in the appearances. There to oppose the habit of exercise. I am rather inclined to pleasure, I will incline to the contrary side above measure, for the sake of exercise. I am averse to pain, I will rub and exercise against this, the appearances which are presented to me for the purpose of withdrawing my aversion from every such thing. For who is a practitioner in exercise? He who practices not using his desire, and applies his aversion only to things which are within the power of his will and practices most in the things which are difficult to conquer. For this reason one man must practice himself more against one thing and another against another thing. What then is it to the purpose to set up a palm tree, or to carry about a tent of skins, or a mortar and pestle? Practice, man, if you are irritable, to endure if you are abused, not to be vexed if you are treated with dishonor. Then you will make so much progress that Even if a man strikes you you will say to yourself, imagine that you have embraced a statue, then also exercise yourself to use wine properly so as not to drink much, for in this also there are men who foolishly practice themselves, but first of all you should abstain from it. And abstain from a young girl and dainty cakes. Then at last, if occasion presents itself, for the purpose of trying yourself at a proper time you will descend into the arena to know if appearances overpower you as they did formerly. But at first fly far from that which is stronger than yourself, the contest is unequal between a charming young girl and a beginner in philosophy. The earthen pitcher, as the saying is, and the rock do not agree. After the the desire and the aversion comes the second topic, matter, of the movements towards action and the withdrawals from it, that you may be obedient to reason, that you do nothing out of season or place, or contrary to any propriety of the kind. The third topic concerns the ascents, which is related to the things which are persuasive and attractive. For as Socrates said, we ought not to live a life without examination, so we ought not to accept an appearance without examination, but we should say, wait, let me see what you are and whence you come, like the watch at night, who says, show me the pass. The Roman Tessera Have you the signal from nature which the appearance that may be accepted ought to have? And finally whatever means are applied to the body by those who exercise it, if they tend in any way towards desire and aversion, they also may be fit means of exercise. But if they are for display, they are the indications of one who has turned himself towards something external and who is hunting for something else and who looks for spectators who will say, Oh the great man! For this reason Apollonius said well, when you intend to exercise yourself for your own advantage, and you are thirsty from heat, take in a mouthful of cold water, and spit it out, and tell nobody. Book 3 Chapter 13 What Solitude Is, 
and what kind of person a solitary man is. Solitude is a certain condition of a helpless man. For because a man is alone, he is not for that reason also solitary, just as though a man is among numbers, he is not therefore not solitary. When then we have lost either a brother, or a son, or a friend on whom we were accustomed to repose, we say that we are left solitary, though we are often in Rome, though such a crowd meet us, though so many live in the same place, and sometimes we have a great number of slaves. For the man who is solitary, as it is conceived, is considered to be a helpless person and exposed to those who wish to harm him. For this reason when we travel, then especially do we say that we are lonely when we fall among robbers, for it is not the sight of a human creature which removes us from solitude, but the sight of one who is faithful and modest and helpful to us. For if being alone is enough to make solitude, you may say that even Zeus is solitary in the conflagration and bewails himself saying, Unhappy that I am who have neither Hera, nor Athena, nor Apollo, nor brother, nor son, nor descendant, nor kinsman. This is what some say that he does when he is alone at the conflagration. For they do not understand how a man passes his life when he is alone, because they set out from a certain natural principle from the natural desire of community and mutual love and from the pleasure of conversation among men. But nonetheless a man ought to be prepared in a manner for this also, being alone, to be able to be sufficient for himself and to be his own companion. For as Zeus dwells with himself, and is tranquil by himself, and thinks of his own administration and of its nature, and is employed in thoughts suitable to himself, so ought we also to be able to talk with ourselves, not to feel the want of others also, not to be unprovided with the means of passing our time, to observe the divine administration, and the relation of ourselves to everything else. To consider how we formerly were affected towards things that happen, and how at present, what are still the things which give us pain, how these also can be cured and how removed, if any things require improvement, to improve them according to reason. For you see that Caesar appears to furnish us with great peace, that there are no longer enemies nor battles nor great associations of robbers nor of pirates, but we can travel at every hour and sail from east to west. But can Caesar give us security from fever also? Can he from shipwreck, from fire, from earthquake, or from lightning? Well, I will say, can he give us security against love? He cannot. From sorrow? He cannot. From envy? He cannot. In a word then he cannot protect us from any of these things. But the doctrine of philosophers promises to give us security, peace, even against these things. And what does it say? Men, if you will attend to me, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, you will not feel sorrow, nor anger, nor compulsion, nor hindrance, but you will pass your time without perturbations and free from everything. When a man has this peace, not proclaimed by Caesar, for how should he be able to proclaim it? But by God through reason, is he not content when he is alone? When he sees and reflects, now no evil can happen to me, for me there is no robber, no earthquake, everything is full of peace, full of tranquility, every way, every city, every meeting, neighbor, companion is harmless. One person whose business it is, supplies me with food, another with raiment, another with perceptions, and preconceptions, prolepsius. And if he does not supply what is necessary, he, God, gives the signal for retreat, opens the door, and says to you, Go. Go whither? To nothing terrible, but to the place from which you came, to your friends and kinsmen, to the elements. What there was in you of fire goes to fire, of earth, to earth, of air, spirit, to air, of water to water, no Hades, nor Acheron nor Cocytus, nor Pyroflegethon, but all is full of gods and demons. 
When a man has such things to think on, and sees the sun, the moon, and stars, and enjoys earth and sea, he is not solitary nor even helpless. Well then, if some man should come upon me when I am alone and murder me? Fool, not murder you, but your poor body. What kind of solitude then remains? What want? Why do we make ourselves worse than children? And what do children do when they are left alone? They take up shells and ashes, and they build something, then pull it down and build something else, and so they never want the means of passing the time. Shall I then, if you sail away, sit down and weep because I have been left alone and solitary? Shall I then have no shells, no ashes? The children do what they do through want of thought, or deficiency in knowledge, and we through knowledge are unhappy. Every great power, faculty, is dangerous to beginners. You must then bear such things as you are able, but conformably to nature, but not. Practice, sometimes a way of living like a person out of health, that you may at some time live like a man in health. Abstain from food, drink water, abstain sometimes altogether from desire, in order that you may some time desire consistently with reason, and if consistently with reason, when you have anything good in you, you will desire well. Not so, but we wish to live like wise men immediately, and to be useful to men, useful how? What are you doing? Have you been useful to yourself? But, I suppose, you wish to exhort them? You exhort them. You wish to be useful to them. Show to them in your own example what kind of man philosophy makes, and don't trifle. When you are eating, do good to those who eat with you, when you are drinking, to those who are drinking with you, by yielding to all, giving way bearing with them, thus do them good, and do not spit on them your phlegm, bad humors. Book 3 Chapter 14 Certain Miscellaneous Matters As bad tragic actors cannot sing alone, but in company with many, so some persons cannot walk about alone. Man, if you are anything, both walk alone and talk to yourself, and do not hide yourself in the chorus. Examine a little at last, look around, stir yourself up, that you may know who you are. When a man drinks water, or does anything for the sake of practice, discipline, whenever there is an opportunity he tells it to all, I drink water. Is it for this that you drink water, for the purpose of drinking water? Man, if it is good for you to drink, drink, but if not, you are acting ridiculously. But if it is good for you and you do drink, say nothing about it to those who are displeased with water drinkers. What then, do you wish to please these very men? Of things that are done some are done with a final purpose, proegumenos, some according to occasion, others with a certain reference to circumstances, others for the purpose of complying with others, and some according to a fixed scheme of life. You must root out of men these two things, arrogance, pride, and distrust. Arrogance then is the opinion that you want nothing, are deficient in nothing, but distrust is the opinion that you cannot be happy when so many circumstances surround you. Arrogance is removed by computation, and Socrates was the first who practiced this. And, to know, that the thing is not impossible, inquire and seek. This search will do you no harm, and in a manner this is philosophizing, to seek how it is possible to employ desire and aversion, ecclesiae, without impediment. Mm -hmm. 
I am superior to you, for my father is a man of consular rank. Another says, I have been a tribune, but you have not. If we were horses, would you say, my father was swifter? I have much barley and fodder, or elegant neck ornaments. If then while you were saying this, I said, be it so, let us run then. Well, is there nothing in a man such as running in a horse, by which it will be known which is superior and inferior? Is there not modesty, ados, fidelity, justice? Show yourself superior in these, that you may be superior as a man. If you tell me that you can kick violently, I also will say to you that you are proud of that which is the act of an ass. Thank you.